All right, so for this Form 1041 tutorial, I want to go through an example for 2022. This is going to be an irrevocable non-grantor trust, so it's a complex trust for federal income tax purposes. And so I want to cover just a very simple example where a trust has income, some expenses, and then is required to make distributions during the year. So as far as what we have in front of us, I've got uh, two slides right just a summary of the things that we're going to talk about the fact pattern and some rules that are important uh, just as an intro of course and then uh, we also of course have the uh, sample 1041 that we're going to walk through so this is a, a 1041 for again a complex trust for 2022 uh, so we'll go through the 1041 and all the relevant schedules and things you need to include and then i do have a sample uh, 1099 so this is a consolidated 1099 uh, for the trust and so these are the income items that we're going to be uh, reporting on the 1041 and then lastly I do have just a very simple reconciliation here and this is going to be important because when we talk about uh, complex trust arrangements and 1041 filings we need to be mindful of the, the, the income and expense activity in the trust but also how do we track this for uh, trust accounting income purposes, right? So fiduciary uh, income purposes. Uh, how do we track uh, the trust income and expense for federal income tax purposes, right? So this is kind of what's reported on the 1041. And then a DNI, so our, our distributable net income issues for um, uh, complex trust arrangements. Okay, so let's go back to the slide. We want to give a, a high level kind of overview of everything we're going to talk about and then get into the fact pattern and some of these basic rules here. So this is, again, this is a 1041, a uh, simple one for a newly formed uh, Florida trust. So this is an irrevocable non-grantor trust. So non-grantor trust, meaning that the trust itself is uh, generally taxable, right? So we have a 1041 filing. If we had a grantor trust, then you likely wouldn't do a 1041. Everything would just be reported on the grantor's return. But in this case, we are doing a 1041. And so trust accounting issues, right? So we, we need to calculate our income and expense or in accountings using basically three methods, right? So we have trust accounting income. This is the accountings that are done pursuant to the trust agreement, right? So the arrangement itself and uh, state and local law. And then we have to do a reconciliation for U.S. federal income tax purposes and then do a calculation of DNI. So we'll go through all of these three pieces, go through the 1041. Pages one through three are kind of like the standard set, that the, the standard set of 1041 uh, that you're going to see in the filing. And then uh, Schedule D in 8949. So we did have some capital gains, uh, some from the sale of stocks. And then Form 1116 is the foreign tax credit. So we are going to have some foreign tax uh, credit issues. And then we'll certainly look at the K-1 for the allocations and the distributions to the sole beneficiary. All right, so here's the fact pattern we've got, right? So Adam Smith uh, is going to form an irrevocable uh, non-grantor trust in Florida. And the beneficiary is going to be a son, and the trustee is going to be a third party. It's going to be a local bank, so Fake Bank Company, Inc. And now, pursuant to the trust agreement, it says that the trustee has to distribute $45 per month. And then they do have the authority to make discretionary distributions of whatever remaining income there might be, if any. right? And so the trust is set up. It's funded. And the cash infusion is just immediately used to uh, purchase stocks, bonds, other types of investments like that. So it's all being contained within a brokerage account, right? There's there's nothing too unusual in that they're, they have other kind of investments. Now, everything is just being done in the brokerage account. All right, so uh, let's go on to the next slide here, talk about some of these general rules uh, that are important for us to know. So. Trust accounting income is the accounting income calculated under the rules of the trust instrument, right? So the trust itself can determine uh, how income and expenses are allocated between income and principal. Uh, but then obviously we also need to be mindful of uh, local laws and regulations. So what we'll see is that Florida, for example, when we allocate expenses, Florida kind of just splits it down the middle, right? So trustee fees, accounting fees, 
split 50-50 between principal and uh, income, but some states don't do a 50-50 approach, right? Some states under statute have different allocation percentages. So uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that when we get into the, the, the this accounting reconciliation here. All right, so now federal taxable income, obviously this is really important, right? Because we're looking at 1041. Uh, taxable income is computed in a similar manner to individuals, right? That's under the tax code. And so we report all of our income um, and we report all the expenses, but certainly some might be not deductible. And we're going to see that when we look at things like investment management fees. And then DNI, again, very important, right? So DNI is, you kind of think of it as this is the maximum amount of uh, taxable income that could potentially be distributed to the beneficiaries. And this is also going to be a deduction for the trust to the extent that it's being distributed out. Now, DNI is interesting because it doesn't include certain things, right? So capital gains, what you're going to see is that's not included. Uh, there are reduced amounts for taxes and interest, extraordinary dividends and the like, right? All right, now what about expenses? So when we talk about expenses on 1041s, for the most part, most expenses are kind of, you know, they're deductible, uh, but there are obviously rules and carve outs which make things not deductible. So investment management fees is the biggest one, right? So uh, if a trust is, the, the investments are being managed by a third party and they charge a fee, uh, these fees are generally not deductible. And that's because the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or the TCGA there, eliminated deductions for miscellaneous itemized deductions. And so investment management fees was one of these 2% miscellaneous deductions and that's now been removed. Now things like trustee fees, accounting fees, legal fees, these are all generally 100% deductible. Uh, trustee fees, as I noted here, be careful about bundled fee arrangements. So what we mean by that is sometimes the trustee uh, is providing those services as a trustee, right? They're managing uh, the trust, but they might also be managing the investments, right? So they're, it's a dual role. And so if you have a dual role and you have a bundled fee arrangement, you're supposed to carve out the component that is related to investment management uh, because that's not deductible. All right, so enough of that. Let's look at the return itself and the accounting. So. This is going to be the accounting reconciliation. I think first, let's have a look at the uh, 1099. So uh, trust, you know, whether you receive this individually or as a trust or a company, right? This is a 1099, a consolidated statement that shows the amount of income and expense that's being incurred within the account. And so we use this to prepare our financial statements, our trust accountings uh, for the trust. So we can see here, this is a 2022 consolidated 1099. It's being issued to the trust under the trust tax ID number. And so the big components here, you can see are, you know, we have some dividend income. So we have ordinary dividends, a portion of which is qualified, some capital gain distributions, some non-dividend distributions. We have some foreign taxes being paid here. So those are foreign taxes withheld at source. And then we have some interest income. Now, as we scroll on down, we can see that we did have some stock sales during the year. So there were four dispositions during the year, some of which were at gain, some of which were at losses. And so we'll make sure all that is recorded accordingly. All right. Okay. So now let's look at the, uh, the worksheet here because this is really, really important, right? So before you even start a 1041, you need to do an accounting of the trust and determine what is the trust accounting income. So the TAEI amount, right? So the actual results column here, think of this as like the actual amounts of money that are moving in and out of the trust. If you have allocations from pass through investments, you know, like partnerships, that, that would also be recorded here. But these are in effect the totals. And then what we do in the remaining three columns is separate out what gets included and what's excluded. So, for example, the 1099 shows that we have interest income, dividends, non-dividend distributions. We have some capital gains, capital gain distributions. And then these were the disbursements during the year. These wouldn't be reflected necessarily on the 1099. But we know during the year the trust paid trustee fees of 1000 legal fees of 500 investment management fees, and there were some foreign taxes 
uh, being withheld uh, on the dividend distributions. Now, when we move left to right, we are accounting for each item depending on you know, the, the rules, right? So trust accounting income, for example, includes these types of income. It includes interest, dividends, non-dividend distributions, but trust accounting income does not include capital gains, right? So you can see here, I've excluded capital gains on the stock sales. I've included, or sorry, excluded capital gain distribution. So that's why trust accounting income from a total uh, gross income perspective is just these three items here. Now on the disbursement side, under the trust instrument and under Florida law, uh, a lot of these expenses are generally allocated 50% to income, 50% to principal. So when we have a trustee fee deduction here, we're only deducting half of it. So we have $500 being deducted for TAI uh, pr uh, purposes, the same with legal fees, the same with investment management fees. The foreign taxes withheld are attributed just to the dividend income. So that's why we're taking a full deduction uh, for trust accounting purposes. Uh, for the $51. And then our net trust accounting income is 925. Now, if we look at federal uh, taxable income and DNI, you notice there's some stark differences here, right? So, for trust uh, uh, federal tax purposes, we record the interest, record the dividends, right? But non dividend distributions, which is a return of capital, a return of principal, that's not taxable, right? Because it just reduces your cost basis in the stock. So that's why when we look at the 1041, you're not gonna see anywhere where, where we would report non-dividend distributions because it's not taxable. The trust does have to pay tax on capital gains, right? So we have an inclusion for capital gains on stock sales, distributions. And then on the fee section, we're deducting full amounts of the trustee fees, the legal fees, the investment management fees, again, as I noted earlier, are not deductible anymore, right? Now, of course, there are exceptions, there's unique exclusions, but for the most part, investment management fees are not gonna be tax deductible. And then foreign taxes paid, this is a foreign tax credit, so it's not gonna be a deduction in arriving at taxable income. So that's why we are not including it here. Now, DNI, remember, DNI is in effect the, the amount of taxable income earned within the trust that could potentially be distributed and passed on to the beneficiaries, right? So, DNI, note here, it doesn't include capital gains, right? So, capital gains on the sales of stocks or distributions, those are allocated to principal, they're not allocated to income. So that's why it's not something that could potentially be distributed to the beneficiary. Now, again, there, there are exceptions, right? You can make certain elections or the trust instrument might provide that capital gains are included in DNI, but under the baseline rules, that's generally not the case. And then the same goes with trustee fees and legal fees. So these are uh, fully deductible, uh, in this case, at the taxable, uh, federal taxable income level, and so the same uh, goes with the DNI computation, right? So these three items, what we're going to see when we look at the 1041 is these are, these are going to show up, and so we'll be able to go back and reference this, and you can see kind of how these numbers are being calculated and reported on the 1041. All right, so let's look at the 1041 now. And we'll start going through uh, some of the key elements here, and then I'll just take each section uh, one at a time. So we have a 1041, right? The name of the trust at the top here and the EIN for the trust. Uh, in box A, we are indicating that, yes, this is a complex trust. Complex trust meaning that not all of the income is required to be distributed uh, every year by the trustee, right? The trustee in effect has some discretion, right? They either distribute a fixed amount and there's some left over or they could distribute none. Uh, it's simple trusts that are, are the trusts that just have to, no matter what, distribute all the current income uh, to, the, to the beneficiaries. If that's not the case, then you likely have a complex trust. And that's what we have here. So it is an initial year return. Uh, we do have not a full calendar year 2022. So we are showing March 30th through the 31st. And then we just have the contact information for the trustee. So fake bank company again is the trustee here. 
and then the contact address. So page one shows the income and deductions and then the ultimate tax liability that's gonna be owed with the return. So the gross amounts of income uh, that we have, remember if we looked at the 1099 and the reconciliation here, we, you know, we had $14 of interest, we have $1,938 of dividend income, and so that's why those amounts are being reported up here as such. So line one, we have our interest income. This is taxable interest. If you have tax exempt interest, different reporting requirements, right? Those wouldn't be included up here. But in our case, all of it's taxable at the federal level. So we have the interest, the dividends, and then the capital gain or loss coming through from Schedule D and 8949. So if I go to the 8949 here, uh, we have listed all of the dispositions during the year. So this is, again, consistent with what we have on the 1099 consolidated. So uh, the type of property, date acquired and sold, proceeds, cost basis. So the net amounts here of 84.17 is being reported on 8949 and up here on Schedule D. And so that's how this number is flowing up uh, to page one of the 1041. So we've got our $9,060 number there that again is it's the capital the actual capital gain dispositions plus the distributions so capital gain distribution 643 plus our 8417 in dispositions is the total amount 9060 that's reported there all right so we've got our total income items up there and then in the deduction section we are deducting uh, the full cost of the fiduciary fees, the attorney, accountant, and return preparer fees. So if we look at our reconciliation here, remember the, the actual fees paid, so 1,000 for trustee fees, 500 for legal, those are deductible on the federal return in full. But when we do our trust accounting uh, internally, right, and it's also necessary for the return as well, but our trust accounting is only deducting half of those. And again, this is going to be an important figure when we look at uh, page two of the 1041. All right, so now if we go back to the return, so we got our trustee fees, our attorney and accountant fees, and then we can see there are adjusted total income uh, before calculating any uh, DNI deductions, right, or income distribution deductions. Ninety-five twelve, that does reconcile with our column uh, here, right? So our taxable income, U.S. federal, uh, for U.S. federal income tax purposes, net adjusted income before the distribution is nine thousand five hundred and twelve dollars. All right, so now if we move on uh, to pages two and three, I think page three is good uh, to really maybe, perhaps even do this first because it does contain some yes or no questions that will drive kind of how you report uh, certain elements on the return. So in our case, you know, all of these are no, right? Because again, we have a very straightforward kind of simple example. But for, for example, in, in question one, it's asking us, did we receive any tax exempt income? If you did, the tax exempt income is not subject to federal income taxes, but it's important because what's required is a reduction in the amount of expenses you incur on the return. And so that's why uh, question one, if we did have some tax exempt income, we would basically have to prorate or carve out a portion of the expenses attributed to that tax exempt income and we wouldn't be able to take certain tax deductions. Another big one that we see commonly is question six, right? So uh, a 663B six, six, uh, six, six, election. So this election is made uh, when a trustee wants to distribute cash to a beneficiary after year end, but have it apply to the current period, right? So in our case, the trustee just distributed all the money during the actual calendar year. But if they uh, were looking to perhaps make an additional distribution apply to this year, they can make a, a, a 663B election and they would have to check the box here. All right, uh, so if we go to page two, all right, so Schedule A, charitable deductions, we didn't make any distributions to charities, so that wouldn't apply to us here. Uh, but Schedules B and G are actually, you know, certainly very important. So when we look at Schedule B, line one, that's the adjusted total income coming through from page one. Right, so Schedule B is where we compute our DNI amount. So we can see here, line seven, DNI. Uh, now again, remember, DNI is your basically your federal taxable income 
with certain adjustments. So we have certain ad backs such as capital gains, right? So we can see here that there's the 9512 coming through from page one, and we have an ad back uh, or, or an elimination rather of our uh, capital gains on the sale of those stocks. So the amount of DNI that we have uh, that could potentially be distributed to the beneficiaries is $452. And so we see that is consistent with the reconciliation we prepared here, right? So DNI, again, these are the, the net taxable amounts that could potentially be distributed to beneficiaries. Our DNI computation is just the interest and dividends and then the trustee fees and the legal fees. So there, that's how we arrive at our $452 figure. Now remember, in our fact pattern, the beneficiary was entitled to receive and the, the trustee had to distribute $45 per month. And so uh, $45, the trust was formed basically at the start of April. So April uh, on throughout the end of the year was you know, nine months, right? So we had $45 per month times nine months. So $405 was the actual amount that was required to be distributed currently and was actually distributed, right? So that's why we had the 405 report on line nine there, right? So there's our 405. And then line eight, if this is a complex trust, which it is, enter the trust accounting income, TAI, for the year as determined under the governing instrument and applicable local law, right? So there is our 925 figure. So 925, again, this is uh, the, the TAI computation that we've done for the trust for the year. So there's our 925, and so that number is being populated uh, into line eight there. So we have our trust accounting income on line eight. We have the amount that was actually distributed or required to be distributed here on line nine. And then we have on line seven, our DNI figure. Now the income distribution deduction, so this DNI figure, this is really important because the trust is allowed a tax deduction for uh, an amount that's actually distributed to the beneficiaries that the beneficiaries will then report on their tax return. So in other words, if we look at page one here, so we've, we've arrived at our uh, adjusted total income, but the trust is only going to pay tax on income to the extent it is not distributed to the beneficiaries. So instead of the trust paying income taxes on, let's say the full 9,512, if any amounts are distributed to beneficiaries and those beneficiaries are now picking up the tab, so to speak, on, the, on those earnings, then the trust doesn't pay tax on that. So we can see here on line 18, we have an income distribution deduction of $405, and that is uh, allowed as a tax deduction for the trust. So the $405, that's effectively being picked up on the K-1 for the beneficiary. So if I jump down uh, really quickly here just to show you how this is working. So the, a K-1 is provided to the beneficiary. It shows the beneficiary received a certain amount of income, like an actual distribution of income during the year, and what their allocations are of the items that were earned in, at the trust level. So in this case, we have the trust here, not real trust, and the beneficiary again is John Smith. And so remember, John Smith received $405 of cash distributed to him throughout the year, right? So it was that uh, $45 per month. And so John's share of the income, that $405 is a combination of $402 of dividends and $3 in interest, right? So if John, if John just adds, adds this up, he can see, okay, well, I received $405 as a distribution from the trust. And this is the breakout, right? I, I, I'm be basically being allocated $402 of dividends, $3 of interest, and so I need to report this income on my tax return, and then the trust itself is not actually paying tax on the $405, okay? All right, so now that we've we've covered the, the D&I issue, uh, talk about the tax computation and payments, right? So trusts are uh, very much, uh, complex trusts are very much penalized in that they have pretty high tax rates and very low income levels. Uh, so the amount of tax that the trust is gonna pay on this taxable income is gonna be $1,704, but they are entitled to a, a small portion of the foreign tax credit uh, because remember on our 1099 here, 
Uh, we did receive some uh, foreign dividend uh, inclusions, right? So there was some foreign dividend payout here on line 1A. And then we had foreign income tax withheld of $51.35. So when we look at uh, the return, right, we can include an 1116 uh, to compute the amount of foreign tax credit uh, that the trust might be eligible to claim. So the trust did complete an 1116, so we've reported the foreign amounts of dividends here. This is per the 1099, so if I go back to the 1099, let me jump down to uh, the last page, right? So we have uh, this bank paid out $131 in non-qualified foreign dividend income, and then there was $51.35 withheld. And so that's what we've reported here on the 1116. The amount of dividends from uh, uh, the investment, $131. And then because we have to uh, compute the foreign tax credit or the FTC limitation based on our income from all sources, what we found here in page uh, two, part three, is of the $51 that we paid in foreign income taxes we're only going to be allowed a credit of 26. Now, the credit carryover still applies, right? So we can claim a $26 credit in the current year, which we have, and then we have a, a portion that is being carried over to future years, right? So we can claim half of it, and then the remainder is, is rolled forward to subsequent tax periods. So if I go back to part or page three of the 1041 here, uh, so again, in Schedule G, we have our taxes computed per the tax table. So if you look at the Form 1041 instructions, you can see within that uh, how to compute the tax on your taxable income. So in this case, you know the software did this for us, which is pretty handy. Uh, so the tax amount, the taxes owed on, on this amount of taxable income, 1,704. We get an FTC for $26. So the net amount owed. 1678 is what has to be f uh, paid and and when 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 we return uh or file the return with the irs right so nine thousand and seven dollars in, in net taxable income a thousand six hundred and seventy eight dollars in taxes and so that's what needs to be submitted to the irs now lastly i want to touch on the allocations of the distribution so remember uh dni under the uh, trust was $452, but the actual amount of distributions paid to the beneficiary were $405. So when we look at the K-1, uh, a, a common and, and fair question is always, well, $405, how do we determine that it's gonna be allocated in this manner? How do I know that $3 make up interest, $402 make up dividends? Why isn't it all dividends? Why isn't it more interest? Uh, how do we arrive at these figures? And so the, the allocations are determined based on relative proportions uh, of the income items to DNI. So if we look at this worksheet here, this shows us how we get those breakdowns, right? So if we look at uh, the amount of the total gross amounts of interest income was $14 during the year. The total amount of dividend income was 1938. So the gross income, uh, available for distribution was $1,952. So if we look at, for example, the interest, right, it, it's $14 of interest divided by uh, 1,952 in total income, and then we multiply that by the amount that's actually distributed out to the beneficiary, so $405. So the interest proportion, 2.9, they rounded up to three. So that's how we get $3 of interest income. And you could do the same exercise for the dividends, right? If we look at uh, dividend income, 1938, as a portion of the total income uh, available for distribution to the beneficiary, 99.28%. Uh, Again, if we multiply that by the actual distribution to the beneficiary, we have $402. So that's how we arrive at, okay, of the $405 that's being distributed out to the beneficiary, the portion that is interest is three, the portion that is dividend income is $402. And so when we add the two up, we get back to our 405 figure. All right, so I think that covers it for this example. You know, I hope that was helpful. Again, I, I want to reiterate that trust taxation can be incredibly complicated. Uh, so again, this is an example that's, uh, I try to keep it as, as simple and straightforward as possible, not too many moving pieces, but all the same, hope it was helpful. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave me a comment below. 
and I look forward to seeing you again on the next video. Thank you.